So today we're going to talk about abstraction layers in C++. So I'm a lead uh, C++ developer at uh, Millennium. I'm also an active member of uh, uh, ISO C++ workgroup. You can go in. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> can, I'm just going to start over because of you, but that's fine. <laughs> no, it's OK. It's OK. Um, I'm an Isra at the Israeli NB chair and Rangers study group chair. And I'm also involved in some international conferences, including this one. <clears throat> I love language and software design, and I also love cataloging. So that's one of the reasons I'm doing uh, cataloging talks. So uh, today, we're going to start with defining what are abstraction layers. Uh, we'll define an abstraction layer model for C++, and it's an experimental one. So feel free. This, is, uh, this talk is meant to be a discussion. So feel free to uh, give me your comments and your ideas. Uh, we'll go over existing solutions of what we can now do and future solutions, or how can we do better. And I'm surprised to see some people here that already saw this talk in the New York meetup, but I appreciate that you're interested. OK, uh, so what are abstraction layers? So software development is all about uh, uh, communicating logic, right? And we need to apply some abstractions. And that's um, grand truth. We, we know that. So from Wikipedia, uh, abstraction is the process of removing or generalizing data to focus attention on details of greater importance. So here's uh, my first example to this, slide, uh, to this talk. Um, look at it and tell me if something bothers you in this code as more than C++ developers. And if so, what is it? Feel free to shout. Size. <laughs> it's always the <laughs> wait. The size is always the first time that I yeah. But please ignore that. That's a slide code. Uh, Daisy. Uh, pointer. Yes. Okay. We have a pointer here, right? But I mean, this is details that aren't related to the logic that we're trying to uh, communicate, right? From the code. Pointer is implementation detail. Why do we have it here? So I guess this is better now, right? <coughs> because now we're iterating with um, you know. A location. Clearly, uh, I think this is uh, this is better than before. Two examples. Um, and by the way, for C plus plus twenty three, you can get std print, which is great. So basically, a wrapper on std format. So what are abstractions? We wanted to define abstraction layers, but let's start with abstractions. How about this example? If I'm asking you now, in which messaging technique should we use? Do you have some suggestions? What comes to mind? Broadcast. Okay, broadcast. Event bus. Yeah. So what? Sorry. Event bus. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, looking at this example, we we missing some info, right? So I mean, the first thing comes to mind. We need more information that, apart from this. So we need to know on which technology are we talking about, on which components, what latency requirements do we have, right? Because that would affect what we're choosing. <clears throat> so those two examples basically come to show under abstraction and over abstraction. And when we try to define an abstraction layer, we need to make sure that we are in the uh, sweet spot between. So I would prefer using this, um, this uh, definition uh, by former head of uh, electrical and CS of MIT. Uh, the essence of abstraction is preserving information that is relevant and forgetting the inf information that is not relevant in the specific context. And that's the point of my talk. So um, here I want to show you um, a very, very uh, basic or very primitive um, and very initial idea of what do we have, uh, wh what kind of uh, thought process we have in mind when we write C++ code and also C code, right? Because this is basically a C code. So we have a char array, and we have the pointer, and we um, increment the pointer. And because we have a char, we know this moves one byte in memory. But if we would have replaced the type, right, we would get four bytes in memory. So there's a thought process here in this oversimplified and very, very simple example, 
we move between memory layout, which is the pointers, the locations, and types. And we keep the, both of them in mind when we write this code, right? So once we make a small change, we need to keep in mind that C++ is doing things differently for different types. It's not trivial. This is another example. I define int here, and let's say I somehow take its address, and now I try to dereference and assign. And here I get a UB. And the reason I get a UB is because we have duality of int and memory address, but you also have invalidity of the address, and we discuss the UB created by it. So this example is from a paper uh, that's called Non-Deterministic Pointer Provenance. And you may think that what I'm talking about is basically belongs to the C world, right? I've just shown you pointers and addresses and things like that. But that's wrong. <laughs> yeah, so I can see Marshall here in the front line knows exactly what I'm talking about. There's like, uh, there's five papers, actually six, including the one that the example was taken from, uh, addressing this exact issues, the issues of, one second, right? Finish my <coughs> sentence. The issue of, um, memory uh, and, pro and the uh, validity of an address um, of pointer. Yeah, Andre, go ahead. So if you have an embedded system with preset uh, addresses. That's UB. <coughs> yep. We're fixing it, possibly, <laughs> with this last pa uh, paper, uh, non-terministic point in provenance, uh, which was basically a wording change. It's not like it's, you know, the UB is not something that we've addressed something that is more than uh, definitions, but uh, it's still a relevant uh, thing to our day-to-day -day life. And as C++ developers, we don't only write on a higher level, level of abstraction, right? So now that we've understood what I'm talking about when I'm referring to abstractions, let's talk about the abstraction layers model for C++. So on the following slides, we'll analyze the C++ language and library, and we'll build this model, which is, again, experimental. Mm -hmm. And we want to identify the borders between layers because my, uh, my suggestion is that that's where we find the bugs. So going back to the example with the UV that we saw before, as I mentioned, the example is about the invalidity of the address, right? So we're now referring to memory layout and bits and bytes. The duality of int and memory address, that's the types part here. And the UB created by using this. So I've uh, defined this thing as layout control, basically the references, the pointers, everything goes into this group of things. And uh, the interaction between the UB and the memory layout and the types is basically what creates our uh, problem here. So again, just to uh, specify, and I've, uh, I'm not going to go over all the language and library um, in this slide, but I do want to show you a few examples, and later we're going to see um, the full uh, table. So for types, we have the uh, language type, but also things that came from the library, conversions and costs, and CV qualifiers. And again, this is my uh, terminology. We can define a different one, limits. For layout controlled, I refer to pointers and references, but also align as, align off. Uh, stop me if you have some question about those. And memory allocation, new delete, memory resource, etc. All right. Moving on, we also have something I've defined as programming source code, which is uh, referring to the binary, but in a higher level. So um, ASM, for example, we can just modify the binary. Inline go to. And linkage and models, extern, export, etc., all that we have. So I think you by now uh, understood the general uh, purpose of uh, what I'm doing here. And as I've mentioned, what we care about is the interaction between those layers. So this is the complete model, right? So each of those groups contain things that we have either in the library or in the um, language. And just as an example, uh, you can, I'm just going to leave it on the screen so you can just get some impression of what goes into each group. Anyone have questions so far? Comments? <laughs> All right. So we have uh, import, export, et cetera, which is in the higher level of binary. We have memory access. We have types. You have control flow. 
control flow. Which part are you talking about? Orange. Second one from the left. Control. Up, right. up, up, up control mm -hmm. flow, right, brother. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, control flow would be if and uh, I'm just like, yeah, yeah things like that. <laughs> um, yeah, and of course, uh, this uh, classification is uh, experimental. So, yeah, so here we have, uh, you know, things that control uh, we your flow of the program, logic operations, uh, compile time placeholders, object oriented stuff and numerics. I didn't really know where to put it, but I put it here. So this is the full list, and again, I'm not going to go into that <laughs> because uh, I, I'm sorry if uh, you know it might be a bit intimidating. Uh, and this is for the library, uh, the library diversions. But now we're going to talk about what we can do with this model that I've just defined. So let's look at our example again. Now we can uh, assign a piece of this code into a specific layer, right? So we've decided I don't know I define an int which is a type. And then I uh, use the address, which is layout control. And I know the different parts of my program are basically belong to different uh, logic layers that I've just defined. I want to show you additional example, which is more recent and more uh, modern C++ related. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, OK, so this is, uh, we have iStream stream, and we define 0, 1, 2. Uh, we iterate over it. And what do we expect to see? <coughs> right? Great, sorry about that. Awesome. Now, let's say I insert ranges into this equation. So we have the ISS thing that we designed before, and then we iterate over it, but we also uh, put it into iStream view and take one from it. And then we extract from it using the extraction operator. What do you expect to see now? I mean, we did, uh, it is a trick question because otherwise <laughs> I wouldn't have put it on the slide, but. Uh, do you have any ideas? You can shout again. Steve, you can't because, <laughs> because you know the answer. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah. Yes, exactly. I thank you for, yeah. So, but yeah, um, again, what, what, you know, zero, two, one, two, one, zero, one, just shout. Zero. Oh. <laughs> that's good. Okay, so what we have actually, yeah, and that's a spoiler for Barry's talk. <laughs> what we get is zero that we take from um, the um, the loop, but then we also get uh, two, because what happened is that we've basically uh, took eagerly uh, one element um, in the from the take and. We um, and once we get to the extraction, we already consumed this element. So as Steve had mentioned, uh, Barry have a talk about this topic exactly in this conference, which is uh, a full talk about what happens here behind the scene and what we can do it, about it. And this example is from uh, Heckel Brandt's paper um, that was uh, basically suggesting a solution, a lazy take. We use a lazy uh, counted iterator under the scene. Uh, but that wasn't uh, accepted. Uh, it was proposed for C++23. Uh, so I'm looking forward to see uh, Barry Stock and his uh, suggestion. But I hope now you can see that these problems actually um, are things that we stumble across even these days. So again, a few papers that try to address it, and we're going to have more to follow. This actually exposed some more uh, inherent bug in the way ranges are uh, addressing. But if we'll go back to the model that we defined, we're now able to mark the different pieces of the code using this model that we defined before. And we know that we create something that is IO. And then we put it into ranges layer. And then we try to access it again as an IO, right? And this is basically what creates this bug, that our attempt to use something in different logic layers with with no uh, addressing to the transformation between them. All right. So we now have the model. Let's see how we can actually use this thing uh, right now. So how would, like, a bug, as I've shown before, for the, for the ranges uh, part, how would you uh, be able to identify something like that or avoid it? So just shout or, you know, whatever comes to mind. 
Okay, code review, that's a good example. Mm -hmm. What else? Guidelines, right? Unit test. Unit test, okay, uh, unit test, yeah, that, that would catch a problem. In which phase would that be caught by using unit test? Unit test, sorry. So we write the program, right? And the compiler you know, uh, gives us some errors, but this compiles, what I've shown compiles. And then we run, I don't know, a basic uh, you know, uh, foo foo test, and we, we make sure that our program do what it wants. And then we go to unit test, right? That's quite late in the development process. Right the first time. <laughs> that could have, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, also an option. And then go back in time and. Um, <laughs> Yes, <laughs> we do. Right, so I've mentioned, uh, yeah, so I got, uh, sorry, wait, where's the name? Uh, jo Joe, right? Oh, thank you, Joe. Yeah, so uh, code reviews and guidelines are very strong tools to address these kind of solutions, right? Um, and we could also do something, you know, to, to address, um, what? <laughs> There. Exactly, there. exactly, exactly. We, we could, yeah, <laughs> right. So I wish that was that simple, right? Uh, we could create boundaries, we could do ex encapsulation, we could use namespaces and headers, etc. We could use code guidelines and code reviews as Joe have, uh, have mentioned here. We could use tools. So just uh, make sure that we're all on the same page. What would be uh, like a possible solution here? To do encapsulation instead of addressing the iStream stream, we're creating our own some kind of a iStream provider thing, and then we can scream at the user if they're doing something that we weren't hoping that they will, right? But that's not a real solution. Why is it not? I mean, David Senkel gives great example of those kind of solutions that we can we can use, and that would work. But why can't we use this as you know a valid? Uh, solution. First of all, wrapping things create overhead, right? Now everyone are okay with getting this overhead. Also, this is a challenge for large teams, for uh, you know, uh, uh, multiple levels uh, developers. We can't actually enforce guidelines in a way that will make everyone uh, all the code safe. And that's there are some really good talks about that as well. And it doesn't help with cross-boundaries code. We still need to be able to write code in some industries, in some domains, that cross boundaries, that goes from the higher level to the lower level all the time. So another solution is to use different language for high-level logic. And when I say uh, different language, I actually mean modern C++. But uh, we have some idioms, and that's great, right? So that, that could solve some of the problems. But we can now decide that we refactor the whole code. And it's also not trivial to learn and deploy a whole new language with each standard release. So in a way, each standard is actually a new language in terms of addressing uh, previous problems that we had. And we didn't provide a solution for existing code. And as I mentioned before, the C assembly levels are not handled. So what am I proposing? I'm proposing to apply this model that we saw before on our code. And I want to apply it on both language and li uh, library. But as I guess may, uh, some of you may know, um, we can't just rewrite C++. Uh, committee and uh, some parts of the community and also a long history that we have are not very happy with now modifying the language. But what can we do? We can actually implement this, uh, this uh, layers level on error messages level. So what I'm suggesting is that we can use the same code, but we can um, get the user to see the errors on a higher level of abstraction. So instead of now saying you can't cast this thing or you know, this, you're accessing uh, the pointer wrongly, what I'm suggesting is that we print the messages on our levels of abstractions that we defined before. So we can now say, you're trying to use something that belongs to I.O. in ranges level. And now we don't have to do anything with the syntax. And that calls for a static analysis tool, right? So I've implemented this uh, script, and I predefined those con uh, tokens. And this does something very similar to what the compiler sees, right? But <coughs> oversimplified and uh, um, no, it's an MVP thing. 
And now I can actually go over the code and mark different tokens from the code with different layers. So now I have the array and the IO, and we're doing something with size of, for example, which is a bug, right? And we can get the error says that we're trying to use array with types, something that is from the containers level with types. And this basically signifies that we're doing something that is wrong here. For the second example that we saw for iString stream, again, we can mark those layers. And we have the IO thing goes into the ranges. And we get the first message says, we're taking IO um, and putting it into ranges. But then we get the second message says, we take in um, ranges and put it into IO. So I think you now can recognize that this is not, um, uh, no, this is not, uh, we can't just use it straight from the box because there's a lot of false positives, right? I still think it's useful to mark those things, especially when we propose something into the standard. So yeah, go ahead, Robert. Oh, can you go back? Yeah, sure. So, so what, when I look at this, um, what, what I see is not necessarily layers, but I see different kind of abstraction mechanisms, right? So you could have, uh, you're doing one sort of abstraction, you're breaking out and you're using another. Right. And, and, and in, in C, we would talk about, you know, uh, conservation mechanism, right? Don't have multiple mechanisms. Because in, de in the design space, uh, <coughs> you know, someone will come up with APIs, they might have multiple ways of doing the same thing. Right. And the thing they never investigate is uh, what happens if I do it a little bit with this mechanism and then shift to this mechanism, because that's a very complicated testing. And a lot of times uh, the people developing software never think about, uh, exactly. you know, that it's going to be used like that. Um, exactly. So, I mean, I, 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 I like it, but I'm not sure the layers is the right level. I mean, I think it's just using a different kind of abstraction mechanism to do the same thing and mixing them together is, is the defect here. Right, so I want to address, and by the way, Robert is active in the C committee as well, so I value his uh, input and he have long years. Um, yeah, so I, I think I'm trying to address exactly what you're bringing up. So once we have a new feature, right? Mm -hmm. We don't usually consider how does this interact with what we have in the language, but now taking uh, IO and considering how it interacts with every single uh, feature or keyword or library that we have, that would get to, you know, that, that's not something that we can actually do. But once we defined those groups, we now go to a, a higher level and now we can just say, I don't care about how, you know, a new container interacts with memory layout. And again, I'm not referring to all the code that is, you know, all the um, logic that, that is used in order to implement the thing. I'm only referring to the layer that you can see in the syntax of the code that you're writing. Uh, that's another <clears throat> comment that I wanted to make later. But now we can actually say, I've added a new IO. I care about how it interacts with containers. I care about how it interacts with types. For example, as Zach has been doing, uh, which is very, very cool in his uh, Unicode proposal, he actually uh, defined uh, uh, formatters, right? And that's actually, that's, a, that's, a, that's an example of a good proposal. So I think that in a way, putting those things into groups actually simplifies and achieve, try to achieve what you're, what you're saying that is a problem. I hope that helped. Yeah, I mean, the simple answer is it, it does if it works. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, go ahead, uh, sorry, your name? Daniel. Daniel, go ahead. Uh, oh, sorry, okay, never mind. Yeah, Daniel. <laughs> so the, the, you, you mentioned false positives, and the thing that I was thinking throughout, like, through your whole explanation was that there is some sort of passing the ownership of the lowest level to True. a higher level, and and the problem here is not that you're passing like a lower level thing to a higher level thing, but that while that is, well, that's there, you're like going back to the lower level again. So I, I think it's more about like this transferring of ownership of like who's encapsulating what. But wait, uh, why, I mean, 
in line seven, we're not in the ranges level anymore, right? So in a way, it's not in the same. So yeah, I. The problem is that you you encapsulated ISS in a higher level. Right. But then you go back and access it in the lower level again. I, I, I agree. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly the problem. And that's so what I'm was, trying to highlight. So what I was, the only thing I was trying to say is you mentioned false positives, but I think that the idea of specifically the ownership of the encapsulation can deal a lot with the, the false positives. Right. So first of all, I agree with you. And it's, uh, I, I say, uh, I think a class of problems that you know, we're probably going to be able to recognize. And I, I completely agree with you. Um, one thing I do want to mention about the false positives and about this uh, over abstraction, you know, uh, a POC tool is that the idea, as at least the, the way I see it, is not to actually print errors on every single, uh, you know, transformation, but to look at those uh, places and actually be able to evaluate and then or maybe just pick some of them and use them. But it definitely helped us uh, sort of uh, put, you know, hotspots on areas of the code that we may be you know, uh, we may uh, fall into. Uh, wait, uh, the person behind the nails. Um, so the Sorry, what's your name? Yeah. Hi. Um, so so uh, uh, from, from your explanation of this thing, it sounds to me kind of like a type system, not in the sense that it's literally defining C++ types, but that like an expression will have some, uh, 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 Classification. some layer right. in the same way that it has a type. And, right. Uh, I think it is. Uh, by the way, I'll mention that Jeff is active in Carbon, and it's really awesome uh, to get your input. Uh, yeah, I think it is in a way. Uh, I'm trying to get away from uh, in C++. We have, uh, which is which is a great thing. This is what defines the language. We have a way of going really low into the details, but. Uh, I think what I'm suggesting is that we also uh, try to uh, at some uh, we also try to evaluate our code in a higher level, which is exactly what you're saying. Uh, the types like system, but you know that gives us um, that gives us information on our logic and not on our how do we hook uh, those things together in a lower level. So basically, uh, we're just we have. The layer that we currently have, which is giving us all the details and unable to instantiate this template or whatever, but we also have this system that gives you information in the logic levels telling you you've been trying to do something very wrong logically in this software. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, first Daisy, then Alex, and then. And I'm really happy about this discussion because. So I think the point that's not getting across in the slide and that some of the objections to it are missing um, is that like these could be in different functions and this abstraction layer mismatch makes it impossible to incrementally migrate your software. Right. Um, so my question is the solution you're proposing, how in the world does that work if these are in different functions? Uh, so. I, that's infectious. So basically, in my in my mind at least, and I haven't tried it in a really complex uh, <laughs> code yet. Uh, once you use something, certain even if you use it inside a function, you now modify its uh, classification, its type, and now you can see it, you know, externally as well. Uh, but I need to see a specific example, maybe missing something. So, you're saying so that the, 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 if you migrate one anywhere in the binary or anywhere in the translation unit, you have to migrate everything in the translation unit. In order to not no, I'm, I'm not saying, are you, are you saying, wait. So I'm not saying that the whole code have to be on the same layer. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that while we transferring from one to another, we want to be cautious. I see. Okay, that yeah. Sense, yeah. Yeah. Sorry for <laughs> Um Alex, go ahead. Well, Daisy asked before me, but, uh, <laughs> but I can answer something a little bit into it. Yeah. The, what, what's the end game? Do you want it to be a static analysis tool or an actual language tool? Because as I see it, maybe the front end for the compiler can see those things and do the calculation for you and do the uh, and, uh, right. the warnings. It's going to be hard, but it's possible. Yeah, but I'm going to talk about the end game soon. 
Uh, but yeah, this is just uh, planning the idea yet. <laughs> Wait, uh, I'll, uh, Andres, sorry, and then Steve. Go ahead, Andres. So I, <clears throat> I see an interesting tension here. Like you, you've been mentioning all of the problems that arise from these different layers interacting, but there's also a benefit, right? Because the, the trivial solution to resolving the problem on this slide would be to just say, like, we don't rangeify I.O. Right, like it's our, 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 our IO library just doesn't provide a range interface, and then there, there's no intersection point here. But of course, mm. that has a big downside in that I now can no longer use the range algorithms here, right? So mixing the abstractions and making them compatible has like real benefits, and discouraging people from uh, like building these uh, these the, these talking points between the abstractions also has a downside. Yeah. And I'm wondering if, if you thought about like this tension that, that we have I, here. Yeah, so I want to answer that. My idea is not to forbid that. That yeah. was in uh, no way, and it, I, if I haven't uh, communicated that well enough. My idea was that we need to be aware, and we need to be aware when A, we standardize something, when we standardize um, uh, ranges and allow getting IO into it, we need to be aware. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. And second thing, uh, we need to may be able to, uh, you know, uh, extract from this information on our code some of the logic bugs. And again, I'm not suggesting that we will, you know, th this is the output that you know developers will see, uh, because this is too too much detail. That's the false positives I've mentioned before. But I I do think that you know just by moving to this model and applying it we can get more information that we now don't have because now this classification actually allows you to, to you know, uh, automate that, you know, you, you're now able, you don't need to code review and, and, and see that someone did something bad. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I'm going to mention a few ideas that I got from the New York um, meetup. Yeah, I still have time, so that's fine. Um, uh, soon, once we move to the next uh, slide. But uh, generally speaking, you can define, you can automate it now, you can define a threshold and you can say, okay, if I move uh, five uh, abstraction layers in the, this three lines, maybe I'm doing something a bit wrong, right? And maybe I wanna code review this specific piece of code with more details because you can't, you know, you can't code review every single, like large code bases, large teams, not every line gets code reviewed, right? But this is how you, um, sorry, uh, Ben and, oh, uh, Steve, did you, were you before? Yeah, sorry, Steve, then Ben, st then uh, uh, Jeff. Yeah, Go ahead, Steve. <laughs> this sort of formalizes, um, like if I was doing a code review for this, it's awfully small to do a code review. <laughs> <laughs> part of the problem. Yes. Um, I'd be hand-waving about, you're, you're mixing concerns here. You're exactly. Um, and tooling would help identify that uh, places to bring more focus to. Exactly. Um, ben, then uh, Jeff, then uh, sorry. Uh, is, is the problem or the, the thing to be aware of here is is it switching abstraction layers or is it going down after having gone up? So if going up loses information, if then going down perhaps cannot recover. Is that the problem? So I just want to say that Amir Kir have the sim similar comment in the New York meetup that maybe actually going uh, up uh, is is okay, but going down is is wrong. That's that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting uh, perspective, and I, I would I would I, I I guess I need the numbers for that. So I would be happy to like run this on several pieces of code and see if uh, the false positives are you know more uh, you know you can eliminate false positi positives uh, more by um, allowing going up. That's an interesting perspective. Thank you. Um, Jeff, go ahead. So, uh, continuing the analogy with type systems, the, um, uh, the, you know, their, their goal is to, to prevent you from, you know, mixing types that, uh, that shouldn't be mixed, but the solution isn't to never right. mix any types. It's to, uh, 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 have, uh, to, uh, uh, change types in, Specific controlled ways, but like implicit conversions that we uh, right. have been used on to understand our, our state. Um, so, so what, what, what I'm wondering is is, is uh, 
is is that the kind of uh, 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 answer that you that, that you, you see here, or is the mm -hmm. or is it uh, some of the things you said mm -hmm. make it sound more like there may not be a structured, uh, completely local understanding of when crossing the layer is okay, but it might involve like looking at the, at the point of use a little more holistically. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, thank you for the comment. And yeah, so I'm just gonna uh, bring up all the uh, so, all more things that came up before. So during the meetup, for example, we had a discussion about having this user defined. So you could like maybe mark a piece of code with an attribute and say, this is my, uh, you know, uh, this is the logic that, but the First problem is that you're getting a very cluttered code, and I want to be able to provide some default. And again, we can discuss on whether the default makes sense, like where I've put in every single thing, uh, or maybe the you know um, the way the layers are being uh, divided, the topics. But I do want to be able to provide some default because that I think will have some benefit by its own. By its own. And on the top, on top of that. You could actually say, I want to add some attribute. And that's also good, by the way, for third party libraries, the things that are, haven't been you know, in, implemented inside your tools, like uh, your compiler, your IDE, whatever. You may be able to uh, use it to find that. So, so that would be also interesting in my mind. Yeah. Um, sorry, uh, what's your name? Peter. Peter, right. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Keep forgetting. I only have a passing familiarity with capability based systems, but this is certainly reminding me of systems where you have like an orthogonal axis to your type system mm -hmm. and in that perspective um, like this ice stream stream is donating its readability if you will to the ice stream view and so there's a sense in which uh, given that ice stream stream is not supporting kind of being read from two different readers um, the problem is that like it's already given up that capability, and so you're using something after that capability is gone. That has really nice analogs to some other parts of the language where we give up capabilities, like you know, move, move, uh, move assignment and things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So hopefully, someone in the room this morning. <laughs> <really interesting. laughs> then, uh, <laughs> yeah, and I'm sorry I don't have a more uh, longer list of uh, you know. Uh, previous uh, work or anything along those lines. I haven't seen something that resembles, but that's a good anal analog, but I've uh, been asked, so I don't know of anything like that in different languages or, but yeah. Um, okay, I have any more comments or ideas here? Uh, actually great, because this is the whole point that was to create this discussion. Um, yeah, go ahead, Tony. Just for Daisy, mentioning, you know, what happens if this is crossing a function? A function is an abstraction layer. So mm -hmm. that's true. If it's crossing functions, you are crossing abstractions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? But it may be too much of a detail of abstraction layer from what I yeah. defined. So yeah. maybe you want to, yeah. Um, yeah, but definitely there's some questions about, you know, what do you do with more complex uh, things than what I'm showing here? Um, but generally speaking, once you're, you know, when you color a piece of code in a certain, again, target, then you are able to. Uh, identify its relations. Cool. So I just want to show you how it looks like from the tool and the uh, error message that you just saw. And this is classifying the tokens and things like that. Um, I want to show you another example um, that speaks about sender receivers. And I think that actually um, maybe gives you a better uh, clue of why this thing may actually work. Uh, so coroutines were added to C++20, and we can define a uh, coroutine, which is a function that we can pause. And we have a task, right? Oh, sorry, stop working. And we have a task, and we need to def define certain things uh, in this task that, that's the protocol of coroutines, right? And we can define uh, get return object, initial suspend, etc. And I've defined here suspend always, so notice this because it's going to be interesting later. <laughs> and now, uh, coroutine, and again, this is not, I'm not going into the details because it's irrelevant. And there's another talk in this conference by Rui Barkan uh, that feel free to go and, and watch about coroutines. Um, but yeah, so we basically uh, create a coroutine, we, we get a handle to this thing, and we now hold this handle. 
and we move uh sorry yeah and we move the control to the coroutine and we execute some code and then we get the control back to main <coughs> right sorry for yeah and then we resume <laughs> So this looks very, very similar to what we're planning to have in C++26, which is sender receiver async, async uh, operation framework, right? And what comes to mind is how does those two things interact? Because if you get, you have a coroutine and you have async framework, it seems to be uh, natural to want to combine those possibly. So again, just for people who may have not seen async uh, the, the uh, sender receiver proposal before, uh, we have a scheduler and we have a sender wraps the scheduler. And now we can basically um, uh, use this algorithm on top of the sender and move the control to the algorithm, uh, execute some code that we've preloaded before, and then get uh, back to main. Very similar, right? So indeed, uh, it's possible to uh, bind those two things together. You can give an async algorithm a coroutine. And it, um, basically how it's defined in the, in the paper uh, sender receiver is that a waitable satisfies the requirements of a sender. Great. But if we would have used this uh, piece of uh, uh, tool that I'm proposing here and the uh, and, uh, um, model, you would have been able to see, even if this code uh, you know, compiles and run, you would have been able to see that you're now combining two things that comes from different worlds. And I think this is important. And as I've mentioned, uh, sender receivers have uh, you know, confirmed that their uh, authors of the paper have confirmed that you can do that. But there is something that you need to um, notice, which is uh, you need to uh, properly define uh, the policy. So suspend uh, never wouldn't uh, may create some issues, and again, this is you know a work in progress, so I don't want to. But you need to use suspend always, and that basically going to work uh, correctly. The suspend uh, the suspension of work uh, may uh, in the wrong way to to generalize this. The suspension of work in the wrong way may create issues with the interaction between in error mess and error handling, etc. And I think there's some people here that know more about sender receivers than me, uh, but <laughs> but I did wanted to bring uh, to put the uh, spotlight on this because this could actually be uh, identified by our tool, right? Now if you run the sender receiver proposal, and you you know some of the examples in the proposal on this tool, you'll be able to actually see that there's something here that you want to put more attention on. So does something like this have a Someone suggested before that you distinguish between up and down. Does this have an up and down, or is it more side by side? Ah, uh, you mean like in in what way up? And, oh, you mean coroutines and async, one above the other. Oh, I'll show. So in my model, I've put them one next to another. Uh, but <laughs> no, no. Down. No. If you decided to only complain about going up versus down, right? This is side to side. Yeah, but um, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I will mention that I've uh, used uh, layers a couple of different times, and there's like uh, a few layers in the model, but I also refer to each of those groups as layer. So um, you, I mean, yeah, you'd have to properly define if which one is, uh, the, you know, uh, considered to be up or down. But uh, also referring, I just, you know, to clarify, I'm also referring not just to going up and down in the model, but also uh, just two things that have interaction between them. So yeah, but you're right that uh, this currently doesn't, um, yeah, it's not defined whether which one is up and which one is down. <laughs> um, and this is another example of my HANA. Uh, <laughs> uh, generally speaking, I don't want to go into uh, exactly what happens here. I just want to go uh, emphasize the point that this conversion it doesn't work the same for both ways. Um, and this could be, uh, you know, uh, reasonable reasoning for that. But still, the point here is that we're trying to um, uh, do conversion between um, uh, different uh, abstractions, in my mind, at least. So that's the file system, the IO part, uh, sorry, the file system uh, group, and uh, strings. 
Okay. So I just uh, said it a couple of times, false positives are very common. So, you know, here's a valid, a completely valid example, and we're moving to things. But again, if we decide that we don't just uh, apply this uh, always, but actually use this as a hint, um, that can actually be useful in your mind. And I've also mentioned um, some examples uh, that we, we currently saw. Uh, this is a question being in the reflector in April, also refers to how do you combine std format with um, Unicode types, right? So here's uh, two, uh, you know, uh, gluing together two of those layers may create some um, subtle um, uh, unhappiness from our users. <laughs> and a good example of uh, something to leave you with a uh, uh, positive uh, as, uh, perspective of the future, uh, Unicode uh, uh, by Zach actually did refer to those uh, things and you can uh, use you know, formatters on Unicode because he defined them properly, uh, which is great. Um, so in a way, he applied this model. I don't know why this is so slow, sorry. He applied this model. So to summarize, um, we have a code that we write and we give it to the compiler and we get compi compilation errors. And then we run this uh, program a bit and we get runtime errors. And then we may uh, run this program with uh, integration tests or more complex scenarios. And we find the logic errors that I've uh, suggested before, or maybe unit tests, that's also a valid um, for, um, phrase, uh, a valid uh, place to find them. But I suggest that using this model, we may be able to pull some of those logic errors to an area stage of our development process. And that's definitely uh, saves us time and money and etc. So for the very least, we may be able to eliminate some of those. And one more thing, does anyone recognize what this uh, piece of code where, where this came from? What is this? Clang Yep, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so this is Clang IST. And the reason I'm showing this IST of this oversimplified uh, you know, uh, piece of code that have no, uh, no uh, library in it and anything else, because otherwise the IST would have been huge, um, I just wanted to show you that this information actually exists in our compilers, right? This information, if you just highlight those two layers, um, we have something here that talks about the conversion and the, and the you know, addressing the, uh, using the address, et cetera. The information that I've mentioned before already exists in our compilers, in our tools. So at least to me, I think this uh, proves that this could actually be done. So to summarize, I'm, I've been talking about compile time errors and runtime errors, and I'm proposing this abstraction resolution sort of uh, error layer that would come after the compile time, but would also be able to indicate something about your logic. And I'm at least hoping that this will allow us to uh, identify errors in an earlier uh, stage of our development process. And I've, uh, as I've shown you, this can be added to compilers and static analysis tools and maybe other tools. Okay. Yeah. So to summarize, um, again, uh, we need to create ergonomic study group, which is something that David Senkel have said, and I think is very true, um, that would help us eliminate some of the issues that come from using code wrongly. But also, I think we should address the abstraction layer model as developers when we write the code, address this model when we um, uh, propose a new uh, feature to the standard, especially how it interacts with other, and examine every proposal, not only in the local perspective, but also by its integration with other things that we already have, which is, again, something that we don't do Eddie, very often. And thank you for listening. Yeah. And special thanks, sorry for the <laughs> special thanks. Uh, so I, I want to bring up some ideas that I got uh, from the New York Meetup, which is really interesting in my mind. Uh, Aditya have uh, mentioned uh, that this thing have, uh, you know, uh, reminded him of the layers that you get in Photoshop. So you could basically maybe tell your IDE that you now want to only see your code in a specific layer and uh, disappear and um, make the other uh, pieces of code that are 
you know, uh, not currently uh, related to the logic that you're trying to address, um, not, not to be seen in your IDE for a specific time. Uh, I've mentioned user-defined layers and attributes that that could be interesting as well. Uh, Amir talked about teachability. So uh, now at least we tell people, you know, don't try, don't use new and delete, uh, use uh, shared pointers or whatever, uh, because you don't want to go to this level and we say it, but we have no uh, terminology, no formal terminology to say, what does that actually mean? You know, combining shared pointers with new and delete. We have no terminology to explain why those two features don't go together. This is something that sort of wraps this in, in a frame. And yeah, these are the references. Uh, as I've mentioned, the talk by Barry Resvin. So if you have a time machine, uh, go see this talk, which is later this week. <laughs> Um, but I think it's going to be a really interesting one. And this is the model. All right. Thank you. Cool. So, uh, yeah, so we have a bit of time. And this is, as I mentioned, meant to be a discussion. So, um, <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. What's your name? Uh, nice to meet you. Um, uh, yeah, so then going back to uh, force positive. Do you have a ratio? I mean, you know, the proportion of uh, I haven't had a chance to run this on large code bases, unfortunately. I am really hoping to. Um, one reason is that I'm sort of manually defining. I, I mean, it should be a, a, a something like a Clang, you know, uh, extra um, implementation. I, I shouldn't be using this uh, oversimplified tool. But yeah, I, I'm now uh, defining those manually uh, on the tokens. And I should be doing this with uh, But yeah, that would be interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, what's your name? Luke. Yeah. Uh, so I'm wondering what the meaning is of the line between the layers. And, and somebody asked yeah. before, <laughs> there's control flow with the yellow layer, and that looks like it's connected to layout control. Yeah. Um, I was trying to emphasize what relates to what. And because of, you know, <laughs> uh, because of limitations of, uh, you know, how you can put it on a slide, I didn't want it uh, to have, it like. Just, it just seems weird to me that control yeah. is lay layout control. Because layout control sounded like layout of bytes and types. Right. And yeah. Slow control sounds more like logic. Right. So in my mind, uh, in a way, that's why it's in a higher level. It's not in the same group, for example. But in my mind, in a higher, um, you know, when you break, you basically, uh, I mean, you clearly uh, use logic. But eventually, um, you also modify how your binary would look like. But it's not on the same level of, you know, uh, defining a line S. A line S, a line, you know. So uh, I've. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't understand that connected in line there, but right. you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but again, uh, just like, uh, I know it made sense to me, but it doesn't mean that. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so I also think you had switch statements somehow landed in logic off. Right. But if statements are in control flow. No, I think the if statements are also in logic ops. I'm pretty yeah, sure. But I'll have to go back and. <laughs> I mean, we can nitpick every little one. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. I uh, should I show you the yeah. There's the slide of uh, the scary one, but yeah. <laughs> Have more details. Uh, go ahead, uh, Joe. Right. Uh, I had a thought about the like warnings being just going up versus down. Right. I actually, think in the example, it's not clear that the error is really that you've gone down. We don't know which code came first. So <laughs> if the code was all written with the low-level streams only, and then you introduce the ranges. You're going up an abstraction layer, but that is actually the place where you've introduced yeah. the problem. So I don't think it's necessarily fair to say that going up is always safe. That's a good point. Uh, Marshall, do you want to? We can say her. Nina. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Nina, go ahead. You just need to <laughs> go up. Yeah. <laughs> it's subtle. And I was yes. Subtle. And I was not. Good, so I know. <laughs> I'm still just processing. So yeah, of course. I, I think what I'm hearing you say is it not necessarily going up or down. It's just having different abstraction models rather than layers that's the problem and it's the interaction between the two that can be a source of bugs yeah so what your current tool is doing ray 
it, I, I wouldn't say it's finding errors and therefore the false positive is probably a con confusing yeah. terminology. It's saying focus on these parts and see whether that you may have some issues, like analyze it. And then possibly with time, I suppose you could build a database of errors when you go between two, if exactly. you have binary modification and linkage and modules and you build a, a database of common errors between the two, then you can start to reason whether you have any of those in your code base to go from focus on this to Here's a hint, you might be doing this wrong, and then you might get into yeah. finding errors rather than finding points of focus. Right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I completely agree, and that's uh, good. That's probably what, I mean, that, that's, in a way, that's something that I, I was trying to maybe uh, um, um, uh, explain better, but yeah, exactly, that's the point. I think that, just like our static analysis tools, I mean, they have, I mean, the, the, the list of errors are, you know, manually picked and people are considering this and, and you know, it came from years of experience or whatever. Uh, I don't think that this, like, could be like, fully automated without any, you know, hand pick of, yeah. Go ahead, Ben. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say something similar to what Tina said. I don't, up and down the simplification, right, the, the real thing you want to flag here is where and, and up and down is from you know where your first slide said typically <coughs> going up involves getting rid of information right necessary information right which means which, but the problem is not just going down it's 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 having it's not having a faithful matchup in information between two extractions right right let me make that clear. right um wait uh, i think daisy then jeff so i mean and out of, in the interest of trying to make an out of the book question you didn't expect. Um, <laughs> wow, that's encouraging. Thank you. <laughs> writing a tool that does this thoroughly and completely seems somewhat impossible for a human. Really? But how about ChatGPT? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Do you see a future in which? some sort of neural network could be trained on what it means to be high level versus low level and try and dissect mismatches in code. Okay, wow. <laughs> so first of all, yeah, I mean, rise of the machines, but I like, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I can believe that maybe uh, AI could uh, save us some work there. Uh, I, I don't know, I mean, been in a way, I mean, it's interesting that you think that it's uh, something that we can't do. Um, I, I, I mean, my impression was that we have all the information and uh, again, in the compiler, for example, and I'm not a compiler developer, but it seems to me like the information is there. Um, and it seems to me like uh, this actually adds some simplification. Uh, this is a you know closed group. Uh, we, we're in a way, a part, like unlike actually trying to see what happens with each keyword, you know, and each library and interaction between two libraries, etc., we're actually getting some abstraction there. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, yeah, sure, I can try to do it with GPT, and it'll be interesting. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Thank you for that idea. Um, I will mention that we actually have some GPT license in Millennium, which is awesome. I was <laughs> positively, positively surprised. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, Jeff, sorry. Um, so uh, regarding the, uh, making a tool for this, I mean, maybe there are some difficulties that I'm not seeing, but yeah, I agree it seems possible to, uh, uh, to build a tool to do this. The part that I'm most worried about is the user experience, mm -hmm. um, particularly around the false positive. Right. I, I've seen very few successful uh, 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 tools that integrate into the, the, the tools that developers will actually use uh, that, uh, in my experience, developers will almost always only use tools uh, if they point out real problems. They have an extremely low tolerance for saying, hey, pay attention to this, and you find that nothing there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm worried about. Yeah. 
so my at least uh, I, again i i would hope to have a tool um you know run first phase then identify the issues then only um uh, export this thing this and and i don't know maybe so I would I would hope that we can actually identify a con, uh, a, like in a constant way, um, in, in a coherent way, the the problems, and then apply this to a new database. And maybe AI would help us with that. But uh, generally speaking, I wouldn't. Yeah, I agree with you that I wouldn't want to have a tool that shows all of those because uh, that would be horrifying. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Is there is there a significance to the the uh, uh, the different colors in, in the slide you're showing right now. So, like, is, is there anything that each of the color group has in common, uh, uh, or is it just that uh, they happen to stack on top of the one? <laughs> Uh, in my mind, at least, try to organize this with some, uh, you know, distance from um, binary uh, level. Uh, but uh, again, uh, it's my perspective of the language. So, um, but yeah, I've tried to, I've, you know, in a way, containers and ranges are built on top of iterators and the, I don't know, and in a way, compile time seems to me like it's getting in in a lower level than the, the abstract algorithms. But uh, yeah, uh, go ahead, Daniel. So one methodological observation is that we, we mm -hmm. in, in the C++ world, we tend to see everything from a mathematical perspective where we have to come up with like the correct classification <laughs> and yeah. the definition of what's problematic. Oh, but maybe I know what a methodological mean. approach that's closer to like economics would make more sense where we just run this across a big code base and try to correlate like over time Oops. like where bugs show up like, where those kinds of things come up and that would allow us to identify particular interactions that are more prone to cause bug to cause bugs than others like maybe going from iterator to range is fine all the time but then maybe going from uh, algorithm to containers is a place where most bugs happen, uh, right? And, and try to focus on like from like, the statistical empirical perspective rather than mathematical correctness perspective. Yeah. So I, I just want to like uh, that's a really good comment. And I mean, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And that could be very interesting. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, there was some notion of threshold that we can define. But I, I think one of the things I'm trying to say here is that if we get this. You know, once we use this, uh, we actually like identify features and, and libraries and classify them. We now able to actually get some numerical them like data, and we can now think of this as you know, for example, doing what you're suggesting. So yeah, um, I think that the the thing that I would like you know to emphasize the most is that we now don't have any way to. Um, to look at, at what we have in the language in any constructed way. And one of the things that that may help us do is to, uh, well, by doing this classification, get the numbers, get the, the yeah, exactly. But thank you, that's that's a great comment. <laughs> uh, go ahead, so Casio. Uh, what Jack <laughs> said, yeah, so developers, they would just ignore the warnings about the <laughs> so But even if we don't get to that tool, I think that somehow could be useful for the, the standards committee to exactly. foresee problems that different features from different people think about their own feature and then when they interact together. But do you see any example, concrete example of some features that will be, oh no, don't do that, or <laughs> some guidelines coming from something <coughs> like that, or some features that are already in the standard and <laughs> Maybe I don't know vector bool. Like <laughs> yeah, I mean, I nothing comes to mind, but I, 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 I mean, I did saw some good examples of things that did address that, and I think that's uh, encouraging. But yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, that could be helpful. Um, Tony, go ahead. Uh, sorry. Two things. Um, like you're saying about false positives, and and, and you mentioned before code review, right? So what you might want to do is run this on the new code, right? Someone puts up a code review. <laughs> I want to know, OK, I, you just changed a whole bunch of code. Which part should I really look at the clo more closely, right? Right. It's like this, this tool will say, look over here. Yeah. This is, you know, maybe it's fine, 
but here's a place. Whereas over here, you know, there was no abstraction changes. There was, you know, yeah, it was just straightforward. Exactly. You know, you glance at it, you go, yeah, okay. Yeah. It's, it's pointing, you know, so it's, I don't want to go through all the code. I don't want to go through the new code. The old code also has bugs, but you know, we don't look at those. You know, <laughs> don't want to add a new bug. Yeah. Um, the other thought I had was with the um, AI and everything, right? Um, there's a couple things there. You could throw AI at the whole problem, and it, it you know, it wouldn't tell you because AI doesn't tell you how it thought. But you know, you don't, you just get answers. Yeah. You don't get, well, what, what was your structure underneath? But you might get this kind of structure out of it. The AI will see those patterns of like, oh, this mixed with this is often a bug and stuff exactly. like that, right? And, and those are features, basically. You can feed them to the AI and get, so yeah. So you've already like short circuit, you, you, you uh, sidestep the AI to say, look, we already see, this is something we can see that missing, you know, mixing your abstraction can be problematic. And I have seen studies um, where people threw, you know, AI at, at code base <laughs> and just see like, you know, where are, you know, what are the common bugs? And to the point where it would just be like, Hey, you used this, and then you did this. Everybody else who does these two things does the third thing, and you didn't do the third thing. That's so, true. you know, it's like you can quickly go from like you're saying. Is at first we can say this might be a problematic um, mix of abstractions to later going like, oh yeah, we've now flagged this as this is always problematic, right? And eventually you can, you can start learning those steps, and yeah. you go from just flagging as maybe you should look to flagging as. You know, it goes from like yellow to orange to red of like, this is really, really questionable. Because we've seen it a million times, it was wrong. Time, <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> Yeah, I, I agree, and that that uh, automation is is uh, will be awesome. Um, I just want to you reminded me one more thing that I wanted to say. So, if you work within the scope of a certain library, right? This code is not generally speaking, you know, apart from implementation bugs or whatever. This code is not interesting because the library, uh, you know. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> this, you know, I'm saying a good thing. This code is not interesting in an error perspective. Um, no, but seriously, like, so as Tony have mentioned, the large portions of your code and, you know, in which you're doing things that you've been always been doing is not interesting and you're wasting time by, you know, uh, code reviewing them. On the other hand, some portions of your code that you're doing something that is relatively on, you know, mixing those or whatever that you want to look at. Yeah. I agree. It may save us some time. <laughs> Go ahead, Peter. Peter, so, sorry. Let, let's assume success. We have this wonderful tool. <laughs> that tells us about, it identifies something. It turns out that something is a false positive because I'm implementing something that's designed across the value. Right? We can think of, I'm writing the iStream range. It's going to be talking IO because that's what it's there for. Um, so in order to get the warnings to not proliferate to users, I need to add the annotations to my code. I need to document, hey, look, I know this is a layering violation. It's on purpose. Um, my concern, and maybe this is too in the weeds, is in a world where we get a fully annotated code base of here's where layer violations are OK, here's where they're not OK, are we actually, is it worth is the cost of having that additional information worth the benefit that we're getting from paying attention because we've diluted a bunch of other a bunch of other information in our layering violation information? Yeah. Does the question make sense? Yeah, so I mean so a few things. It depends on what you do with those errors, right? Because you could say like uh, my code mm -hmm. wouldn't compile uh, um, if you don't eliminate all of those errors and then in that case You'd have to fill your code with those uh, with this attribute that says that, that that's okay. Don't worry, um, but it doesn't have to be. You know, it doesn't have to be. I I am. I mean, you you could again. You could apply it in different life cycle, like in different stage of the life cycle of your development, and you could decide whether, um, you know, I only run this um, when I do integration tests, whatever. And you can also decide I only run this when I propose a new uh, standard, uh, uh, you know, pre new feature for the standard, and I only care about, like, and I only do it for the examples. So, I mean, unless we now decide that we block every, <laughs> the, the compiler uh, would not compile unless it, you know, the whole thing is solved, 
uh, I think it's going to be okay. <laughs> and, and we already have those things, right? Warning, warning as errors, etc. It's not like necessarily says, it's not, there's not only one way to get input, to get information about your code that is, you know, fail the compilation. <laughs> um, I guess, but maybe I'm optimistic. <laughs> Go ahead, Robert. Um, um, so I might be a little too focused on, on your one example, um, but the one with the taker, I mean, to me, the problem is the, that the, you know, the the state uh, is represented in the data structure, right? And and so um, you, you get this, uh, um, you know, if you have a, for analogy, sort of analogy, right? If you have a train switching thing, right? The train goes, then you have to hit the switch, and if the train goes back, then you hit the switch again. But you don't, you know, train goes once and you hit the switch twice, right? But then you're gonna have a crash. Right. And so it, it feels like it feels like you have to have some, you know, limited operation that you can perform on the data structure, which is what C is all about. Right. Right. And that an abstraction layer that's using that piece of data has to obey the data the data abstraction. Right. And so in this case it sounds like the taker algorithm violated the data abstraction of the of this underlying piece of data left in the inconsistent state, that a, a different uh, algorithm that then processes it misunderstood, or, or basically the, the, yeah. the, the state was incorrect. So, you know, for this specific problem, it feels to me like like the solution is more there. How do we preserve through the interface of this data object the yeah yeah the state of the correct state. Yeah, so I agree with you that this uh, there's definitely bug there uh, in in ranges, but um, so so yeah, I mean, and again, the Barry's gonna have a full talk about that, but I still think that these places are error prone. Even if you discard a specific example, those places are error prone. Um, thank you. And you know, new delete with shared pointers or with smart pointers is continuously a problem. So yeah, I mean, even if you'll fix this one, and this one was just you know the thing that sparked this uh, idea in my mind, but yeah. Um, OK, uh, I guess, uh, uh, sorry, th there was a question by you. Sorry, yeah. what's your name? Uh, Ashley. Ashley, right. Hi, thank so you for. Just regarding the like developing the static analysis tool, right. uh, it seems to me that Right now, we, we like if you, if I develop this, I'll be testing on the existing library functions. What about do you have like any comments or suggestions of like um, adding and incorporating new kind of like libraries or functions or layers? And because it seems to me like it's more like an experimentation where you keep like in, uh, testing the interaction between different like uh, like layers and see which is causing the bug, which is not. Yeah. And just uh, my concern is like in future if you are adding more layers more functions this would be like very problematic to like add new information all the time yeah so i actually had i uh, got the same question uh, in the in a different place but yeah um so you could uh for example mandate uh you know every new proposal have to define on which layer it's you know which layer it uh, belongs to and in that way if you already automated the other parts you know putting aside uh, daniel's uh, proposal about you know going for the numbers or or um uh, tony's uh, you could, like, this actually give you, the fact that you actually now have a model gives you some ability to predict. You know, in a way, it gives you some ability to um, define this thing, classify this thing, and now you don't have to um, manually decide because you just cl classified it as part of the model. And we already know that, I don't know, um, async operations, they don't go very well with the uh, memory allocation, whatever. Um, yeah. yeah. If, if Go ahead, Tony. You, you've got a model of C++, right? But then you've got your own code base. And yeah, you would want to categorize your whole code base. Of like this this class over here is over here. And this, and then that'll take some time. But once you got that, when you write something new, you would automatically start thinking, well, what category does this belong in, right? And you'd be like, well, is, this, is this kind of another I.O. thing I'm doing? Or yeah. is this another, you know, I, I work on projectors. Is this in the projector category? It's like, a category just for my software, you know, like, <laughs> and, but yeah, so it, it is, it would be a constant maintenance of yeah. 
everything everything new you write, you have to say what category is it in. But you probably just start thinking that way. You'd be like right exactly. off the start, like, oh yeah, this goes in this category, and you might actually help you design something better by knowing up front that you know, because you see it all the time. Someone writes a class, and you're like, what the heck did you just make? <laughs> and, and within this class, you you cross seven categories, like. Your class, <laughs> maybe if you had thought about it from the beginning, you would have been like, oh, I don't know what category this is in. Oh, oh, maybe uh, you're already down the wrong path. So Yeah. And yeah. I just want to say one thing um, to address that. So I have a, a an int A here, right? It's a new thing. It's not part of the standard library, this A, but it still get the category category uh, because I defined it as type. So it's not like that every single line of code you need to add, you need to now say, I have a new cl a class called uh, uh, type with <laughs> uh, capital uh, T, and now I need to say what it is. No, it's basically, uh, I don't know, belongs to the type, I guess, <laughs> uh, layer. Um, but so you see what I'm heading. It's not that you have to now manually add every single, but I mean, Tony is completely right saying that this would at least help you, you know, have this uh, mod uh, process in mind when you write this new code. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Marshall. Yeah, I'd rather agree with Tony and Ashley Russell, right? Yep. Uh, before her, before him. Yeah. That, you know, if I wanted to apply this to a large code base that was not part of a standard library, so it didn't have. Right. I would want to define my own layers. And yeah, yeah definitely. It would need to be extensible enough that I could define new layers and define interactions between yeah. them. Because otherwise, it would just find stuff where I use yeah, everything. Everything would yeah. be in the type category. The type. I guess. Um, I have, so yeah, so just to address that again, uh, I did mention the attributes, the user defined attributes. So you could use attributes for user defined layer, and that's how you'd address uh, third par uh, party library or new code or whatever, which is what I've mentioned before. <laughs> Go ahead, Daisy. So there, there's been a lot of work on languages that try and push more and more of these layers into the type category. Hmm. Um, I mean, you think yep. of things like Haskell, right? Um, and people don't use those languages, mostly. <laughs> um, OK. <laughs> so I mean, the interesting question is, if we start pushing these kinds of things into linters, are we doing kind of the same thing, but just at a different level? Or are we actually creating something that's understandable by junior developers, unlike Haskell? So I haven't seen the Haskell uh, model, and I'd be happy to. <laughs> um, in my mind, it, uh, it, I mean, I don't know. Uh, in my mind, it helps us um, drop some uh, level of details that we don't need to uh, reason with our with our code because it moves us to the logic level. It, but that's just in my mind. So <laughs> that's that. Uh, yeah. What, what's the um, you know the early uh, reports on concepts? Because like, concepts is exactly that. We've added another layer to the to the type system. Right. And to you know categorization of types. So. And maybe we'll find out, oh, the average programmer is like, I, I don't care, right? Or maybe the average programmer is like, oh, this is great. I've always thought this way. I just couldn't put it into the, into the code. Yeah, so I would like to, uh, <laughs> Cassie, would you like to respond? I mean, yeah. we're very we're very excited about concepts in Millennium. But I mean, this is an exact, <laughs> exactly an example of yeah. this, right? Yeah. So we're pushing ourselves towards these languages like Haskell that have very mathematical abstractions that people just don't use because it's just too much to do your day job, right? I mean, I would also say that the fact that you haven't looked at Haskell probably proves my point, right? OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a good uh, so it's, it's an That's a good argument. Are enough out of the way, or warnings like this are enough out of the way that people won't just try it and get around them and get their job done. Yeah, but I mean, now you get things like, uh, I don't know, template instantiation failed, whatever, tons of lines, and and you may be uh, getting something like you try to uh, instantiate over, I don't know, whatever that comes from a different layer that you shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. So that could, in, again, it, that's exactly, yeah, but that's again my, I, I, uh, one second, I just uh, like Ben yeah, have been. <laughs> so in defense of Haskell, I think. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Very usable by junior programmers precisely because the compiler and the tooling give them so much help. It is much easier to get.
get into a large code base in Haskell and make changes that don't break anything. That is using a language like C++. Hmm. That's why everyone's Good to know. doing it, right? CMU teaches Haskell to undergraduates, but it will not teach C++ to undergraduates. I know some people were just, uh, Marshall had a reaction and then, oh, yeah. My reaction is that, that, that external tools are always a tough sell. Yeah. Um, I, I, have, I struggle to get people to use address sanitizer, okay? Yeah. And address sanitizer has a false positive rate that is near as damn it to zero. Yeah. So my question is, uh, with the people here involved in the standard committee, would you agree to use this tool at least? And <laughs> that that would be a win. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, go ahead, Steve. Um, some of the conversation about talking about like library organization and where things go um, reminds me a bit about well what we're about to have with modules because modules make it right much much more uh important to define your layers um you can't have cycles with modules so you have to build layers up and it makes it very visible what you're depending on and maybe you're going down too many layers or not um you know some parts of the standard library are going to be used <laughs> by every module everyone is going to use stood string in their their interfaces but in your own code you probably shouldn't be interacting exactly. with too many layers at once yeah that's a good comment and i should have emphasized it more i did it's very important that we uh, use this thing, not, but you don't go all the way up to analyzing whatever can, comes from your library, et cetera, because that would be a mess. Um, the idea is to focus on the, the uh, you know, the, the, the thing that, that, you've, that you just see in, in front of you. And, and, um, and it's also not trivial to define the, yeah, but I agree. <coughs> Um, okay, so I think we're basically running out of time. <laughs> that was really a lot of discussion. So thank you very much, everyone. And I'm really um, happy that you accommodated my, my idea. Thank you. <laughs>